And tonight you're going to hear from some of our faculty, some of, some of our staff, some of our students about their experience. And I think it will be very insightful to you as you think about and prepare for your, your service. You know, about two years ago, I got a call from the Director of External Outreach and Strategic Recruitment at the United States Agency for International Development also known as USAID. And he was asking us if we would be interested in hosting a di development diplomat in residence program. The program is designed to place a senior foreign officer here on campus who would conduct outreach and recruitment for the agency. So I contacted Dr. Richard Marcus Professor and Director of the Global Studies Institute and Inter uh, excuse me, International Studies Department. And we invited the deputy down. He wanted to visit, tour the campus, and, and talk to us. And Richard and I asked them, why CSULB? Why are you considering our campus? And he said, last year I attended a job fair event on your campus. And I was impressed with the quality of your students, their strong interest in foreign affairs and foreign service, and naturally, also the diversity of our campus. And we were in competition with some very elite research institutions across the country, mainly back east, closer to Washington and the headquarters of USAID. But he, uh, he really uh, enjoyed our, the visit, he enjoyed you, and so for the last two years, we have had a diplomat in residence on campus. And in a few minutes, I'll introduce uh, to you the diplomat in residence. Now, I had the pleasure of meeting our president, uh, Dr. Jane Close Conley, a few months before she, she became our president. This was a little over four years ago. And uh, she may not remember, or she, she may remember, we were on a video conference uh, where she was off-site and we were uh, with a group of students uh, discussing some very difficult issues at the time. And I was very impressed with her demeanor and attitude towards our students. And I said, wow, she is going to be great at Long Beach. She got, and I believe she has this just based on her her history, her experience as a, a professor, as a university administrator, as an author, and as a researcher. In fact, her main research interest has been to promote equity and educational attainment across all socioeconomic and ethnic groups. And I said, wow, she's going to be fantastic at uh, Cal State Long Beach. So at this time, I'd like to introduce to you our president, who would like to share with you some opening remarks. I appreciated uh, Manuel's uh, remarks, he, but he had that in the future tense, didn't he? I thought she might be great. He didn't really finish that sentence, did he? And she was! She should have said that. I'll go back and tell him that now. I'm really delighted uh, to be with all of you tonight, uh, especially to have a special welcome to our diplomat in residence, Mr. Alfred Nakatsuma. Uh, we love having you on our campus, it's just a delight. Um, you know, our goal uh, as a university is to offer a global education. And that's, you know, that gets more and more critical every year as we're so hyper-connected to each other across the globe. And I've heard from many of our students that they want that kind of global competency, a clear and comprehensive understanding of the world beyond our borders. And when I say that, I mean our literal borders, but also our intellectual and cultural borders. You know, certainly we do that by sending and assisting our students to study abroad. Uh, that's an important way to attain a global learning. But the other way is to bring the world in all its complexity and wonder to our campus. The USAID Diplomat in Residence program is an exe excellent example of uh, bringing intercultural learning opportunities to you, our students, and to faculty colleagues. Uh, there are only two USAID diplomats in residence in the country. Let that sink in. There's only two. 
and we have Alfred with us. And I might add, uh, though um, Manuel uh, talked about competition from uh, uh, Eastern universities, I was particularly glad that USC and UCLA wanted him, but we got him. Go Beach, right? Uh, yeah. Go Beach. Uh, so the position of diplomat in residence was designed, I understand, to recruit a more diverse talent pool to careers in international affairs. Affairs, excuse me. I'm afeard of some of the affairs, I guess I, that was a Freudian slip. Given the current hiring freeze on federal employees, uh, Mr. Nakasuma reimagined the position to be far more broad and innovative, and that's what he'll be talking to you about, I'm sure, in part. I also hope you'll say a few words about your own experience in the senior foreign service around the world. As I read your bio, I found it really fascinating. So thank you, Manuel Perez of the Career Development Center, Richard Marcus of our Global Studies Institute, uh, Terrence Graham, <clears throat> oh, and there's, there's, there's somebody else on the panel, but uh, I, I didn't bring the program, so I apologize. Um, for bringing this, uh, for all the hard work and putting this together and bringing this really rare opportunity to the beach. I'm very excited about the coming two years. Go beach. Now, as I mentioned, uh, how the uh, USAID was very interested in our campus because of our strong interest in, in uh, foreign affairs. A lot of that has to do with Dr. G. Josie. Uh, Dr. G. Josie is the Associate Vice President for International Education and Global Engagement and Dean of the College of Continuing and Professional Education here on campus. As Associate Vice President, uh, he is the Chief International Officer of the University. And in this role, uh, he advises the president and the provost on all matters related to international education and advances the university's global mission by establishing strategic international partnerships and creating engagement opportunities for students, faculty, and staff. He oversees the, the strategic plan for international education and works to enhance the internationalization goals of the campus. He works, he works closely with administration, faculty, staff, and students on all matters related to international programs. It's my pleasure to introduce to you Dr. Jo Joseph. Uh, thank you, Manuel, for that uh, nice introduction. Good evening. Welcome to Peace Corps Week. Uh, this program is partly organized by the Peace Corps office here at Cal State Long Beach and also the Global Learning Institute and the Center for International Education. Uh, I am delighted really to have this program uh, this evening and so uh, wonderful to see many students, faculty and staff here in the audience. Uh, it is a special pleasure for me because uh, back in the late 70s, early 80s, I used to work for Peace Corps for seven years. I think I just told you how old I am. Um, and uh, one of the wonderful experiences that I had in my professional career was with Peace Corps, working with many volunteers. Uh, I still have many, many friends, probably in almost uh, every state here, who uh, were volunteers in different countries. And my specific assignment was in uh, Nepal. And earlier this evening, uh, I was uh, talking to Alfred about uh, my experience with uh, USAID projects in different uh, countries. So before I came to higher education some 25 years ago, I used to work for a lot of development agencies, including Peace Corps, USAID projects, projects in, uh, in Africa, projects in Asia, uh, mainly in higher education capacity development projects with governments in foreign countries. And these experiences led me, you know, really to work in the international education arena, and I ended up where I ended up. Um, and I was at a, at a conference last week. Uh, it's the American uh, Internet, uh, Association of International Education Administrators out in Washington, D.C. And uh, we were, uh, Cal State Long Beach, 
among the master's comprehensive universities who were one of the top 10 Fulbright producing university for last year. So that was a very nice recognition. Fulbright put a reception the International uh, Institute for International Education, IIE, and Fulbright, you know, jointly you know, put that program together. So it was wonderful to be recognized that way. And we were also one of the top producers in the previous years you know, as well. And not long ago, uh, Cal State Long Beach was also one of the top producing uh, university for Peace Corps. Uh, we used to send quite a few Peace Corps uh, volunteers, you know, from here. What that tells us is how global we are and how much we value international programs. Uh, that we are excelling in multiple fronts. You know, certainly we have many international students from almost 100 countries in this university. We have 62 different exchange uh, agreements with overseas institutions so that many of our students could study abroad. In addition, uh, some 40 plus programs every summer and winter uh, is led by our own faculty in all different uh, locations around the world. All in all, almost, almost we're approaching 1,100 students, Cal State Long Beach students who study abroad. So we're doing a lot of stuff uh, in the international education arena. Our faculty is instrumental in this, and uh, professors around the world program has taken them to de multiple destinations as well. Uh, in the meantime, we are internationalizing our curriculum on campus with some faculty incentives to infuse international content uh, in the course curriculum that we have on campus. So that even if you, for some reason, aren't able to you know, travel overseas, you have international exposure through your coursework right here, right here on campus. So I'm quite excited about this program. Uh, I do know that uh, the experience overseas, either through USAID, Peace Corps, or any other number of opportunities that we have, uh, like the internship program we're promoting at, at Cal State Long Beach, uh, is an uh, amazing experience to complete the overall education uh, that you, especially I'm speaking with, uh, with the students, that it's an amazing opportunity to, uh, to have being able to uh, do an internship, work abroad, or study uh, abroad for a semester, for summer, or for the full year. You know, whatever you can do, whatever fits in your schedule, it's a wonderful opportunity. So I welcome you uh, to this program. I'm looking forward to the conversation that we're going to have. I am sure it's going to be amazing. Thank you so much. As I mentioned, this is our second year having a diplomat in residence. And last year, um, we had a woman named Miss Cheryl Jennings. Some of you may have worked with her. And I think she did a great job in laying the foundation for the USAID on campus. This year, uh, the diplomat in residence is Mr. Alfred Nakasuma. He has dedicated his career to international development with USAID. He is a member of the Foreign Service and served USAID uh, missions in Bolivia, Guatemala, Indonesia, Philippines, the Regional Asia Mission in Bangkok, and in the Washington, D.C. headquarters. Prior to his current uh, position as diplomat in residence here on campus, he was director of USAID's Asia's Regional Environmental Office, where he oversaw U.S. foreign assistance for environmental activities in 24 countries. As the diplomat in residence, he will establish and strengthen international development partnerships, carry out public diplomacy, and implement the agency's diversity outreach and recruitment activities. He will cover not only this campus, but the western region of the United States, including Hawaii. And I'm trying to convince me, him to take me on one of his recruiting trips to Hawaii. <laughs> he graduated with a Bachelor's of Science in Civil Engineering from Stanford University, a Master of Arts in Economics, and a Master's in Urban Regional Planning from the University of Southern California. 
He received a Fulbright Fellowship for Fieldwork in Peru and a Mansfield Fellowship as an exchange official inside the government of Japan. He speaks five languages, including Spanish, Indonesian, Portuguese, and Japanese. It is my pleasure to welcome to Cal State Long Beach and to introduce to you Alfred Nakasumi. I also am humbled and honored that the president of the university, Dr. Jane Close Connolly, was here. She's had an explosively busy day, um, if you know what I mean. And the fact that she came all the way, to, thank you, doctor, for coming. Uh, I'm so honored that you're here. I'm so thankful to be at, at this university. It's a great university in so many ways. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm meeting faculty. I, I've met a number of students. I, I sincerely hope that I can be some value added and make some contributions towards the noble goals that have been spoken about just before me. Um, thank you, everybody, for the welcome. Uh, so I'm here at the beach. And um, I work for an agency that sends hundreds of people to Afghanistan and Pakistan and Iraq. Uh, we're now going to Syria, uh, South Sudan, uh, Congo, Burundi, Liberia, on and on and on. So these are my buddies. I've worked with them for a long time. And they say, Alfred, so uh, what do you got going? What are you doing? I say, well, I work at a place called The Beach <laughs> in California. And, uh, and I could just see them shaking their head and rolling their eyes. And I tell them, but listen, I'm doing some serious and important work out here. And they say, really? What's that? And I say, honestly, my job is to inform, influence, and maybe even inspire the next generation of America's successful professionals and maybe even leaders. That's my job. I take it seriously. It's really important to me. That's what I want to do. So how am I going to try to achieve that? I really believe that an international element in your education for proficiency, for competency, for just understanding what's happening in this planet is really, really important. I really believe that. I spent a long time working with, in Washington with some of the leaders of our country, spent over 20 years working overseas, and I really believe that that, that is true. Um, it's true for a number of reasons. It's, uh, if you are minded to, to get a job here in the United States, it's true for you as well. Um, it's not, I'm not only advocating about international careers. I was born and raised in East Los Angeles. My mother was born and raised in Guadalajara, Mexico. My father is Nisei Japanese. So I'm the product of immigrant families. You might say, well, listen, I want a job in America. My parents want me to stay close. My dad wants me to make a lot of money. I've gone through all of that myself, actually. It's not easy convincing parents that you want to drill wells in Burkina Faso or distribute bed nets in Mindanao, Philippines. But I'm not saying you have to do that. What I'm saying, and I think a lot of the other teachers are saying as well, is just develop some proficiency and understanding about what's going on outside of the United States. It's really, really important. Furthermore, if, if you want to be successful in the private sector, there's so many reasons to understand what's going on outside these borders. Furthermore, if you want to aspire to become some kind of leader, you've got to know what's happening outside the United States. And I'm not going to leave it just at that. I also want to talk about service. Because ultimately, ultimately, and I can say this looking backwards now, you want to live a life that's interesting and challenging and rewarding and meaningful. And I got to tell you, service wherever, it could be in East LA where I'm from or in Burkina Faso, service is a noble and interesting and challenging and rewarding and meaningful thing to do. So I want to plant those seeds in your head. And while I fiddle with this machine to get a slide up, 
so, next slide. Okay, a busy graph. Don't pay attention to this. Don't, don't pay attention to the details, but I want to have this as background to my next point. I want to go back to the people who say, you know, I want to work in America, at least for a while. Don't, don't talk to me about Africa right now. This is, I want to get a job here in the States first, pay off my student loans, make mom and dad happy. You know, I, that I got to do. Cool, I totally understand that. But if you're thinking private sector, if you're thinking business, you know, just on a lark, when I was preparing this, this talk, I thought, you know, what are three private sector companies that represent well the United States? And I picked, out of the blue, GM. I picked, out of the blue, Apple. And I was thinking a little bit more towards the millennial folks, or maybe you've moved beyond Facebook to Instagram or whatever, but I picked Facebook. So what these three graphs show is something really interesting. GM in 2017 sold 10 million cars. Guess how many were sold in the US? Three. Four million were sold in China. The rest were sold in other places. Okay, so Apple. Apple sold 220 million phones last year. How many were sold in the US? 70. So Facebook, how many people have accounts there? Last time I checked, 2.2 billion. How many accounts in the US? About a tenth of that, 230 million. So I just named three companies that are driving America's economy, private sector companies to which maybe some of you guys might aspire to work for, maybe, maybe not. But you have gotta believe that those companies are prioritizing an international perspective. You gotta believe that. Don't believe that they're only thinking about CONUS, the continental US. They're really interested in people who are thinking beyond what's going on right near their inner circle. Also, let's talk about supply chain management. Um, look inside your computer. I challenge you to find anything that's made in America. If you want to work for manufacturing or companies that sell overseas, that are involved in componentry for gadgets, those companies want people who think international because their supply chain comes from all over the place. When's the last time you picked up a phone and dialed an 800 number and you got a Filipina from Manila or some nice guy from Bangalore on the other side of the line? So let's talk about outsourcing. A whole bunch of companies do outsourcing now, and when they're thinking about hiring, they want people who have some kind of knowledge about what's going on outside the United States. Um, let's put business aside for a second. Let's talk about what's happening in the world. Two big things are happening. Well, a lot of big things are happening, but two things that I, I wanted to mention was interconnectivity and the way high tech is driving your lifestyle. Your lifestyle is now being driven thanks to the big commercial machine that the private sector represents by high tech. And some of this is involved in big data, and you guys are entering data points into your phone every time you punch something, and the people are trying to sell you stuff. So big data, we're talking about genomics, not only stem cells, but genome technology. We're talking about robotics, these are things that are shaping, will shape even more at an accelerating pace your life. So you guys got to know that robotics, the United States is actually not ahead, or at least significantly ahead. Robotics, look to Japan, look to Germany. Robotics is the cutting edge is not always, most often not in the United States. Same is true with genomic technology. For political reasons, the last administration had some religious issues, and so funding stopped for this and prohibition started for that. And the research on stem cell therapy went to Korea, went to China, went to a whole bunch of other places. We're not on the cutting edge anymore. So the point I'm trying to make is with interconnectivity and with high tech not being centered here in the good old US of A, if you want a job in those areas, it's probably a good idea to think 
collaboration, understanding, knowledge about what's going on outside of these borders. And then you might say, well, I'm not interested in that. I'm going to grad school. I'm going to biz school, or I'm going to do some high-tech research. Well, if you're going to do high-tech research, be prepared. The people who sit next to you will probably be from South Asia or East Asia. Because in a lot of the great, the best schools of the country, the majority of their population aren't from here. <laughs> They're from over there. So it's good for you to understand that. But even more so, you want to go to biz school? Some of the, most of the best biz schools are not looking for good old all-Americans. They're looking for super well-rounded people who understand how the world works. Because that's the way the economies are going. So I mentioned a few reasons why, even for people who are interested in working the, in the US, you got to have that kind of element in your head. Also understanding, I'm going to go back to service. Understanding the way most of the world works gives you some kind of perspective, some kind of maturity, some kind of empathy, some understanding about what goes on outside of the continental US. And guys, for any job, that's important. That really is. So um, my point is that what, every, what all these teachers and these leaders of this university are talking about, guys, really believe it, because I spent 20, 30 years out there working with leaders in private sector companies and in other countries. They got your back. They're doing the right thing. So I want to spend a couple minutes here, and I hope it's not uh, an abuse. And Dr. Joshi actually stole my thunder because he was talking about a lot of the great programs you have. But I think it's a worthwhile use of my time to talk about some of them, just so that, just in case you're, you're not aware, you should know about this. And, Sorry, I'm putting on my glasses. I'm going to do some reading. I know that doesn't sound so interesting, but this is really great stuff. Of course, you've got classes. Of course, you've got fabulous teachers, and I've met a lot, of them, a lot of them here tonight. But these internationally oriented programs, I want to give particular kudos to the president and the associate VP for international education and global engagement, Dr. Joshi, to Terrence Graham. He's running the Center for International Education. Under his belt, the Confucius Institute, American Language Institute, a ton of other programs that deal with exchanges. Um, study abroad, office and education abroad. I think uh, this is being managed by Sharon Olson. CSU academic year study abroad. CSULB semester study abroad. Summer and winter session short term. CSULB faculty led international studies. Graduate school abroad. Internships and volunteer programs abroad. Teach English abroad. Research opportunities abroad. Linda Olson Levy, preeminent scholars and fellowship program. The Boren, the Fulbright, the Gates, the Mitchell, the Marshall, Humphrey, on and on. All kinds of fellowships which they're going to help you to access. The Global Studies Institute under Richard Marcus, Richard Fabulous, great. I have to say that because he's kind of my boss. Um, the internationalization of the curriculum, research on internationalization at CSULB. The Global Fellows Program, lectures on global issues, international interps, internships development. The Strategic Peace Corps recruiter, mwah, Jessica's fabulous. California Institute Studies Project, uh, the Global Learning Inventory. Uh, he also is running the International Studies Program. Over to Tim Cairn, International Education Committee at the CSULB Academic Senate, who's got the faculty representation from all colleges and subcommittee for working on world regions, et cetera, et cetera. We have the Yadu, Yadu Nandan Center for Indian Studies, the Graziadio Center for Italian Studies, Center for European Studies, Center for Middle Eastern Studies, Office of Multicultural Affairs, and there's a lot of stuff under that. And then you have Jose Miguel Martinez, who's running the Graduate Studies Resource Center. You have Barbara Doten, who's running the California International Studies Project, and there are a lot of things under there. You have Phi Beta Delta, an honor society designed to recognize specialized achievement of international students. A lot of students' associations, I'll give a, a, a shout out to a couple of them. And I know what the, if I'm not mistaken, it was the International Studies Student Association who put out the spread today. Thank you. I'm going to give a round of applause. That's super great stuff you guys did. Um, will you please save me one of those sandwiches? They, they look really great. Um, 
so South Asian uh, Student Association, Gulf Coast Consortium Student, okay, I'm, I'm not a really good reader. There's a lot of stuff going on here. There's even, even an Anthropology Student Association. I wanna give the last shout out to um, Manuel and Aaron Booth Cotto, who I did see here a little earlier. The Career Development Center, you guys are fabulous. Going global, helping you guys get jobs overseas or even here with an international fla flavor to it. The Student Abroad Scholarship and the Career Counseling and helping you make presentations and marketing your study abroad experiences through resume writing, interviewing and networking techniques. Okay, and there's one other thing which was not on the list that was given to me, which I asked for, but because I, I just, I want to see what are the international programs that we have in this university. Thank you, Jessica, for compiling this. One that wasn't on there that I think deserves honorable mention is, Manuel, you fought for a passport office and you got it. And thank you, President, for supporting that because you've made it easy for people to actually go overseas. Studying's cool, better to be out there. And that, even to that level of detail, I'm so impressed. Last thing I want to say is that this is Peace Corps week, if I'm not mistaken. Did Jessica run away? Okay, so um, I've met hundreds of Peace Corps volunteers, and one thing they all have in common, everybody loved what they did. Now, why would you want to live in a Nipah hut in Mindanao for two years and get bitten by mosquitoes, or drill potable water wells, or deal with sanitation muck in Micronesia when you could be watching the Dodgers, um, doing Instagram, eating In-N-Out burgers. Instead of that, you get dengue and you get malaria. Now, now, why would people unanimously, in my case, say, I loved it, I'd do it again? Why? Because interesting, challenging, rewarding, meaningful. I remember those because of an acronym, ICRM. Remember that. And, and for a much better answer to why would you want to join the Peace Corps, talk to Jessica, because she's fabulous. And this is Peace Corps Week, and she did most of the organizing for this evening, so I'm really, really grateful for that. So service, remember service. And with that, I think I have, I have something like nine minutes left. I was asked to talk a little bit about myself, which I'm normally not good at, but for the purposes of this audience, I think I will. Uh, even the president asked me to do that, so I can't say no to the president. Uh, does anybody recognize that building? Okay, that's downtown LA. That's LA Department of Water and Power. After I graduated, my dad, my lovely dad who's passed away, said, son, you got some college debt to pay off, and we're an immigrant family, and you gotta make us proud. Go out there and make some money. I said, okay, Dad. He didn't know that I applied to the Peace Corps and was nominated and was getting ready. I was gonna like, give him a happy surprise, but he shut that off. And so I had to tell Peace Corps, no, sorry, I can't do that. I went here and worked for three years, and it was a really cool place. Great job, great job. I'd say nothing bad about DWP. But something really struck me. I attended a number of farewell retirement parties for people who had worked for 40 years in that building. Super nice people, super competent people, but I thought, is that me 40 years from now? No, not possible. Not gonna do that. The world's a lot more interesting. I don't need money and stability that bad. So I moved on. I went to grad school, got a Fulbright grant after finishing my graduate degrees went to Bolivia, and I thought, oh my God, there was a war going on with, no, I'm sorry, that was, that was in, yeah, there was, Sendero Luminoso, was, there was a war, civil war going on, a little dangerous, I didn't care, it was so interesting, so beautiful, so fascinating, and I applied my, my college degree and was helping them with their irrigation network, and you can see one of the projects here, a small scale project, and they're eating chuño, which is a potato that they grow out there, they're not playing marbles, uh, but I thought, man, this is really interesting career. I think, I think I like that. So I went to Bolivia and again applied my engineering degree. You see the D6s and the D12 tractors on the lower left, lower right side. 
the US government was building irrigation networks and, and roads because this phenomenon called El Nino produced droughts in some areas and floods in other areas. So did that, fell in love with the women in the bowler hats. And I thought, you know, I really, really love this kind of work. I'm never going home. So I joined USAID as a foreign service officer, worked in Guatemala. And I know Dr. Chinchilla can speak a lot more about this than I can. Uh, but I worked on sustainable agriculture in the Altiplano, the highlands. Uh, on my free time, I worked with the Widows Association in the Ischil Triangle, uh, which was an area where all the men got killed because there was a civil war going on there too, and all the men were killed by, by well, well, we'll leave that for another discussion. So a bunch of widows out there, they weave really well, so we were helping them out. And the biggest project that I was working on was getting U.S. government money to support researchers understand what the Mayans did in terms of sustainable agriculture in lowland tropical, subtropical forests. Learning that lesson to help people who live in the Paten, the northern part of the country, do sustainable agriculture in a tropical setting and also help the country make money off archaeological tourism, something that is now called the Ruta Maya. So absolutely love that. And then I was force sent. I didn't want to ever leave Latin America. But uh, people in Washington said, OK, you're out of here. You're going to Indonesia. And my response was, where is that? Um, so I spent a total of eight years in two tours because I absolutely loved Indonesia. And, and the, the, the issues are so dramatic. 250 million people, still pretty poor, living off of natural resources that are being totally wiped out by big fishing, illegal fishing, unsustainable fishing. And at that time, a deforestation rate, which was about 1 million hectares a year. 1 million hectares a year. That's huge. Um, so that was a super compelling thing to do. I loved it so much, I went back there and spent a total of eight years. But in between, I was sent to Washington, where I worked on disasters and conflict. Uh, here, a few of the 230,000 people who lost their lives, they're in body bags, going to be put here. I was basically first on the ground with a team of 12 U.S. government officials to spend a huge chunk of money to help the people of northern Aceh, which is in the northern tip of Sumatra, recover from that. Uh, this is what it looked like everywhere we went. This is a helicopter shot, on the ground shot, um, worked with with uh, the U.S. Navy that an aircraft carrier posted outside of Aceh. We, uh, we, they, they let us ride in their Black Hawk helicopters doing drops of food. Super fascinating. Did this all over again in Pakistan. Uh, those are our U.S. Army Chinook helicopters bringing in all kinds of things. This is in the Kashmir area, working with the Paki military. Fascinating, fascinating service stuff. Um, a few years later, was sent to Fukushima. You guys may have heard of the, the nuclear disaster, earthquake, and tsunami, all packed in one on the ground. This is what it looked like, ground zero in Fukushima. Um, I shot so many pictures, I don't know if those are the best. But a lot of those kinds of things. There is no disaster that doesn't have an element of politics to it. I got to meet some, some big shots, work. Uh, I'm an FOB, a friend of Bill. I think he's, he's fabulous. I, he came out to thank all of us who worked on conflict and, and disaster work because it's not exactly the most, the safest of jobs. Um, and for conflict work, I was sent to Congo, Burundi, Liberia, Colombia, Sri Lanka, any, basically anywhere where there was a war, I got sent uh, in Pakistan talking with the mullahs and the community leaders in the Northwest provinces in Haiti working with pretty violent gangs, giving them peace for work activities. They make a good amount of money by doing civil works, cleaning up sewers, things like that. This was working with uh, the rebel leaders of, at that time, the country of South Sudan. At that time, it wasn't a country. South Sudan was a renegade rebel providence, province, working with them to try to work with the North to figure out a way that we can give birth to the country of South Sudan. Um, so, but the worst conflict ever is the conflict in the office. And here are a couple of my staffers uh, going postal and 
showing their boss what they really think about him. So um, I want to leave that illegible slide, but just to show you, at some point we're going to make this available. This has a summary of all the things that I, in an out of breath fashion, was trying to go through all the international programs that you have at CSULB. I'm sure it's not perfectly correct. Thank you, Jessica, for compiling that. If you guys had that sheet, maybe you already do. I think it would be really helpful. So um, I want to tie it all up by saying I, I tried to explain why it is that I'm here. I really do believe, as the leaders of your university do, that an international element to your education is really important. I know you're trying to get good grades. I know you got jobs. I know you're trying to make mom and dad happy. Hold on to your boyfriend and girlfriend. You're, you're busy people. I know that. But guys, please leave some room for international elements to your education at this important time in the formation of your career. I want to talk about that. I also wanted to make super big highlight of all the resources you have at your disposal to make that happen. I stand on the shoulders of giants, some of whom you've just met. I'm going to try to be helpful and add to that so that you guys can take, can get the benefit of all this. I really appreciate the warm welcome this evening. What an incredible opportunity to, to meet some of you. I, during my tenure, I really hope to be useful to the student body and the university. Again, I'm humbled and thankful for the, pres the presence of the president. Um, guys, to add on to this, we're going to segue now into a panel discussion where you're going to have some of your leaders and stars and, and uh, super knowledgeable folks talk about international experience. So guys who are going to be moving stuff, please get ready as I give my final thank you uh, of humility and appreciation to everybody, all you guys in the Student Association which put out the great food, did all those flyers. Uh, Jessica, I know you were, you were leading the conspiracy to do these great things. What a warm, warm welcome. Uh, what a huge turnout on a cold night. Really appreciate that. Looking forward to meeting all you guys. Thank you so much. <laughs> Wonderful. So um, I was actually going to introduce the panel, but for the sake of not only getting all the details right, but for the, for the sake of the panel telling you themselves what they do, I think it's actually a little bit more effective that they introduce themselves. So what I want to do is just explain the format here and ask you guys to get ready because after we're going to go through five to six minutes. Each panelist is going to get a chance to talk about a couple things that I will put before them. But immediately after that, we're going to segue to these two mics. And what I'd really like to do is to get you guys to think of questions that you want to ask these super knowledgeable people. The tougher the question, the better. All right, this is your chance to get back at your teacher and ask them a real tough question. So um, I, I just first like to say that I, I actually, I, I looked at the bios of these people and wow, we're really, really lucky to have such incredible scholars here. Um, so as I said, I'm going to ask them within five or six minutes to do a couple things. Number one, introduce yourselves. Tell us about your, your international experience and what you're working on now. And I want to work in one more thing. If you have any advice for the students about international work or an international career, go ahead and do that. I know that's a lot to ask in five or six minutes, so I'm going to shut up and turn the mic over to you guys. But I think that would be great. And guys, as soon as we're done, we're going to go to you guys for questions, OK? Are we good? All right, and so just to shake things up, remember, this is time to trip up your teachers a little bit. I'm not going to go in order. I'm going to do a little bit of a surprise thing and ask Dr. Laris. Dr. Laris, you have, you have an amazing set of experiences in Tierra del Fuego and Mali. I'm blown away by what you've done. Doctor, you're, you're up first. Thank you. All right, am I on here? Can you hear me? Yeah. All right. So. Um, I had some notes, but I'm going to just toss those aside and, and, and talk about my mom. Because my mom would be giving me a really hard time right now. Um, whenever I bring a friend home, or, uh, whenever I bring a friend home, so I always remind them that when I was about your age, I was an engineering student at UCLA, and whenever the talk of travel internationally or learning another language came up, she would always say, Paul, you never wanted to do any of those things. 
I remember very clearly that you said there's plenty of places to travel in the U.S. Why would I ever want to go anywhere else? And if I don't want to go anywhere else, then why would I ever learn another language anyway? Well, I was an engineering student at the time, and uh, you know, how many engineers do we have here? Yes, that's my point. <laughs> As engineers, we don't take enough GE, and it's only getting worse. But I'll, I'll get off that horse for a moment. Um, I, I ended up going to graduate school and had the good fortune of having a good friend of mine who was in the Peace Corps in West Africa writing me a letter about some amazing, uh, wild, crazy party that was happening in his little village in Sierra Leone. And I all of a sudden was in a quandary. Should I finish my degree as, a, as an engineer or should I go on and, and, and travel and, and, and join the Peace Corps? I wanted to do something with engineering other than design turbocharger parts, which is what I was doing that, uh, that summer. Um, so I had this quandary and I was walking around with, uh, I'll give her credit, a girlfriend of mine named Valerie, she was from France, and we were at a street corner and I'm just, I'm so lost in my head and in my thoughts, should I, should I go to the Peace Corps or should I get my engineering degree, should I, should I go to the Peace Corps or should I get my engineering degree, she finally just stops and looks at me and she goes, oh I don't know, should I, should I cross the street this way or should I cross the street that way, what should I do? <laughs> And she just looked at me like, come on, make up your mind. And, and you know, that, that was what I needed. Um, I quit grad school and, and joined the Peace Corps. And the next thing I know, I was in a little village in, in West Africa. I was way over prepared or over um, educated for the task, which was helping women design these little stoves out of clay and mud to make their cooking a little bit more efficient so they used less wood. Um, as an engineer, I was worried about clearances and micrometers, and in the Peace Corps, the idea was, well, if you could fit your finger between the pot and the clay, you've got, it, you've got the clearance just right. <laughs> and although I was way over, you know, engineering gave me a great background to, to go do that sort of work, but I was way underprepared in terms of cultural, you know, knowledge and exchange. But I did the, I did the sort of Peace Corps thing, and I, and I brought my bicycle with me, and, and uh, I went out and did whatever the people were doing. Um, so I harvested millet, I, I harvested cotton, I harvested peanuts for three or four months. I struggled to learn the language because of course I hadn't any experience learning languages before that. And finally I knew enough of the language of a friend of mine about my age that I still know well, turned to me and said, Paul, you didn't really come all the way to Mali just to farm peanuts, did you? And I realized at that moment, hey, I achieved my first step, which is to sort of integrate and, and learn about people there. I spent three years there and I did a number of different projects in, in, in addition to those stoves. Um, and, and years later in, in, in graduate school, after getting an environmental science degree and I was in, in a geography program and looking for a, a topic of research, I, I thought back, my head went back to Mali and, and how people set so many fires there and how the, the government agents just were not happy with them for setting fires. And I thought, you know, that's a really interesting topic. I wonder why people set all these fires. And, and how they do it, and so on and so forth. And well, you know, basically here I am, uh, about a half million dollars worth of grants, and I don't know how many papers uh, later. It's been a wonderful career going back and forth to Mali to study the environment. I had the good fortune of a year ago um, in my same little village where I, I served as a volunteer. I had three former students from here with me. Two of them had been in the Peace Corps. I had two graduate students with me who were doing research, and all of us were in this little village for New Year's. And it was my 30th uh, sort of anniversary of, of being there, so that was, that was a really, um, a really wonderful time. Um, so I think in, in closing, you know, what's one of the things we asked like, what's a what's a major barrier to doing international, getting involved in international uh, work? Well, uh, a closed mind. Um, you know, you guys are all here, so good for you. Go tell a friend of yours. It, it was a friend that told me to go to Peace Corps. And, and, changed uh, you know, my life to travel. Um, and as far as careers, forget about it. Just go. Just get out there and go do something. I had no clue what I was going to do. Look where it, it's, it's been a perfect experience. So just go do it. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Larris. I'd like to uh, ask uh, Terrence Graham, please uh, address the audience. Can you hear me? Yeah. Can you guys hear me? Yeah. All right, great. I, you know, I, I think similar to Dr. Lara saying, when I, when I look back at, at where I've come from, it, it, it kind of all makes sense, but 
if I were at, back at that point when I started off in an international career and looked forward, I had no clue what I was doing. I didn't have any career path. I didn't know well, what I what I wanted to do, and, and that was okay. And that's not it's not a scary place to be. Don't, don't let that that worry you. I had uh, I was interested in, in, in Peace Corps. I applied for Peace Corps uh, as as a senior in, in the university, uh, but Peace Corps. Uh, I didn't wait to go on Peace Corps. Peace Corps. I had an opportunity to go with a faculty member, my Russian history professor, Michael Smith, who's now a professor at Purdue University. Uh, he, he got a, a group of four of us students together and took us to a place called Yaroslavl, Russia, in, in the fall of, in the summer of 1993. Uh, and you know, Peace Corps said, well, when you come back from Russia, we can you know, renew your application and anything. But I didn't really ever come back from Russia. From Russia. <laughs> And so, so I, I created my own my own version of Peace Corps. I think I guess the the, the goals or the things that attracted me me to Peace Corps kind of kept me moving moving forward and, and focused on the things that I that I found interesting and, and, and valuable. And, and so I so I kept going. Uh, so that little two month faculty led study abroad opportunity. You know, I had been an English major in 1993 in Russia. I was there. I could speak English. I got uh, I got a job at two universities teaching English. Uh, it was it was surprising how uh, easy it was. I went to an office where somehow they fixed my visa and made everything okay. I didn't ask questions. Um, so I stuck around for about a year and a half. Went to graduate school. Then led led a study abroad group to Moscow um, as as a PhD student and took those students back to Columbus, Ohio, where I was at the time. And turned right back around. Went to Moscow. Didn't have a job. Didn't know what I was going to do. I, I knew people there. I had an apartment uh, set up, and that was all that I needed. It just took a little bit of time uh, to, to to get settled in and find find a, a decent enough work. And it was it was just that was where I wanted to be. It was it was a fascinating time, a fascinating place to be. Uh, and you know, and once I got kind of pulled into that international work, and for me, Russia was kind of the the pull. It's a, it's a fascinating place if you study the history of Russia. It's just kind of all of uh, the bad of humanity in it. And, and so that, that fascinated me, um, and it was a great opportunity to be there. Um, and, and that's, that's a, you know, a part of it, I think, thinking back to those moments in time, taking that leap of faith. You know, I didn't have a plan. You know, I could have, if, if, if you wait for the, the, the circumstances to be perfect, then you're never gonna go abroad, because they'll never be perfect. You'll, you can think of a million reasons not to pursue an international career, because it's easier to stay here, less resistance, your parents are telling you to stay, your friends are telling you to stay. But taking that leap of faith, and for me it was that, that second trip when I went to, uh, took a leave of absence from my PhD program and, and went, went to Moscow without a job, just having confidence in myself that I'd, I'd figure this out. And a couple people, that was all it took. People, people lend a hand if you, if you ask for help. Um, and, and so that, that set me on my way, and, and that connection between kind of the international work and, um, I mentioned the study abroad experience, and how, how for me that was the opportunity that just opened up my my, my eyes to the world, um, and you know, it was the start of a great adventure, and that adventure just just keeps going on, and that's that's what working international is. It, it's an adventure. It's an adventure, and, the, and the, the main thing is to just set off on that adventure. Have confidence in yourself that you'll figure it out. You don't have to know what the end of the adventure is. You just need to start. Uh, and so, you know, it, it's, it's it's brought me back uh, to. Uh, and I'm, I'm stuck with education, believing in education, working in education as in, in its connection with, with uh, bringing people together, but also um, uh, you know, addressing the issues of, of uh, educational development, uh, bringing, uh, bringing students into touch with in contact with others, and, and, and opening their eyes to the world. So those are the things that I believed and I wanted to do. That's why I thought about going to Peace Corps in the first place. I ended up doing those in my own kind of winding path, uh, and that. Landed me here in Long Beach a few years ago, and, and, and so my focus here is on, on connecting you and students like you with, with those opportunities so that you can set off on your adventure uh, and, and experience the world uh, in your own unique way. Thank, thank you so much, Mr. Grimm. I'm, I'm hearing some resonating themes from the first <laughs> two speakers. I'd like to turn the mic over to, to Dr. Norma Chinchia now. So there were three girls in my family, and at this point in my life, people always ask, well, how come you were the one that always wanted to go abroad, always wanted to leave the United States, always were taking risks and going to the States? 
And I have no answer to that, except I do remember that as early as the age of six that I always wanted to go whenever missionaries from Africa came to my church. And I wasn't so interested in saving souls, but I liked the part about the latrines, building the latrines, and vaccinating people, and making people healthy, and having girls go to school. That was like six years old. I remember that very clearly, and I named my doll after one of the missionaries that I read about. So. I don't know, it, might, it was very early, but anyway, when I was in high school, um, my friend and I talked my mother into letting, our, and our parents into letting us go to Jalapa, Veracruz, to the University of Veracruz summer session. Now, I don't think it was meant for high school students at all, but somehow, you know, we talked our parents into it, I don't know how, you know, they didn't really know. And um, we went to Veracruz, we went to Jalapa, and had the time of our lives. I learned how to dance. I, I, you know, my family doesn't dance. I learned how to drink a little bit. My family doesn't drink. Um, you know, and I learned how to live in the moment, which my family never lives in the moment. We're always worried about the future. And I thought, man, there's there's something missing in my life. So I'm going to get here somehow or another again. And so when I was in college, uh, after, as I was graduating, I heard about this Fulbright fellowship that was for college graduate wasn't for serious researchers but somehow uh, Senator Fulbright had gotten the Congress to agree to have like 10 fellowships for different Latin American countries where you could go and just be a student at the university and win Latin American college students over to the American way of life basically I mean we were supposed to you know try to win them away from communists and the other evil people in the world. Of course, you know, it was a mutual winning, as you might imagine, and some of us came back a little critical of U.S. policy, but that, I get ahead of myself. So, <laughs> anyway, so I thought it was going to be like Mexico, you know, where everything was cheery and wonderful and happy, and um, it was a... It was, I'm not sorry ever that I went. It's changed my entire life. It's brought me the most amazing experiences, just, just as you were talking about. If you want to live an exciting, fulfilling life, um, and it doesn't have to be with your paperwork, it can be with your service, it can be with the people you know, or, or the causes that you get involved in, uh, this, is, this is the way you do it. So Guatemala changed my life, but it was a tough year. It was... Um, um, there was a military dictator. Um, they were killing off the first guerrilla group, and they would, you know, kill people right in the middle of downtown. Um, there were threatened coups. Um, all kinds of things happened that year, and I was a little naive. Uh, I thought I was savvy, you know, as an American college student from the 1960s, but I didn't know anything. And I would go around asking people what they thought of the government, or. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, first of all, it took me a while to realize that nobody was going to answer that question. Um, but I learned so many things, and I made wonderful friends, and of course I fell in love with Guatemala um, and Guatemalans and the villages that I spent time in and just everything. And I ended up also marrying into a Guatemalan family eventually, so I was tied to Guatemala. So over the years, as human rights violation, so then I went to graduate school. And I could have never survived in my PhD program, which was really not a pleasant experience um, at all. But I could have never survived if I hadn't had that perspective about the issues I wanted to understand from being in Guatemala and being exposed to Latin American sociologists who had a different view of sociology than we did here in, these, in the States. And I was really lucky because at the University of Wisconsin, there were students from Africa, from Latin America, and from Eastern Europe. And many of those went back to be important people in governments or in it. And we all banded together and kind of kept people, kept each other alive in graduate school. So, you know, I became a professor. Uh, I was first at, a, at the Claremont Colleges, then at the UC Irvine, and now here at Cal State Long Beach where I've actually been the happiest of any. Um, and um, I've gotten to teach about Latin America, international issues, and about other things. But in the 1980s, uh, the Guatemalans and Salvadorans started coming to Los Angeles, as you may know. 
and they begin pouring in because of the wars and because of the repression. And our government at that time defined them just as economic migrants, but many of us who were understood the conditions they were coming from felt that they were refugees. So we had all of these different campaigns to try to protect the refugees from being deported. So many of the interfaith groups were part of the sanctuary movement, where we had uh, people in churches being protected. And, and uh, so in many different ways, I got involved. And one of the ways was the Salvadorans and Guatemalans came to those of us in Los Angeles who they could identify who spoke Spanish and who had some knowledge of the conditions in Central America. So those were like XP score volunteers, missionaries, people like me who had a fellowship, some anthropologists, and they said, look, you have to help us. You have to become an activist on our behalf. And they would ask for things that I didn't have a clue how to do. They'd say, I want an interview with the Archbishop. Like, well, first of all, I'm not Catholic. Second of all, I don't know who his phone number, <laughs> or anybody who has his phone number. And so all of these things, they wanted interviews with the LA Times, editorial board. I mean, the things you learn to do as a result of just being activist or being doing service, however you wanted to classify it, it's just amazing. And you don't have to take a graduate course in the university. So as a result of these ties with these folks in this new city, um, a whole new world opened up to me. and. We, we were successful in many ways over time, and then I ended up writing a book with Nora Hamilton, uh, who also was an activist at that time, an academic and an activist. And we wrote the book about the experience of the Guatemalans and Salvadorans coming into Los Angeles. I didn't think anybody would read the book. Um, I didn't remember the publisher saying, how many copies do you think this would sell? I thought, well, maybe 400, 500, I don't know. Well, of course, history has a way of taking care of things for you. And I totally agree with our other two speakers that none of this could have been planned out. I just took the first step. I, I applied for a Fulbright Fellowship to Guatemala and got it. And then beyond that, everything else took its own course. So we ended up, the book ended up being a foundational text in U.S. Central American Studies today. And, you know, I've ended up getting a few awards and things in recent years, but I never thought that I would end up where I am. Um, what is my advice? It's kind of the same. It's like you have to just take a couple risks and take a couple steps, and other things will open up because you can't, I don't think you can possibly plan out your life if you don't know what's out there, right? Or how you're going to react to what's out there. So I, I just, say that I've had the most wonderful life. I've faced a lot of hardships with people, people I've known have been killed, tortured, in prison, all kinds of things, but I consider it a blessing and a wonderful way to you know, have a career. Fascinating, deep, profound. I'm, I'm going to turn to Dr. Richard Marcus for your comments, and if you have any kind of thoughts to, to bundle, to tie this up, uh, Richard, that would be wonderful. No <laughs> uh, I'll start by keeping on the theme. Uh, I, I was the unusual one and still am in my family. Uh, I decided at nine years old that I wanted to be a professor. Um, I, I, my parents didn't go to college. It was a very strange thing. They didn't quite understand why I would want that. Um, and they also, it was a very sort of geographically insular family with no international exposure. So when I started putting up uh, maps all around my room of the world, they didn't understand. When I started learning French, they didn't understand, right? But, but they went with it. They were very supportive. Uh, I said, I want to go off to college uh, and I want to go to NYU. And they said, we support you entirely emotionally. <laughs> so, so I had to get a scholarship, and I was successful. I got a scholarship off to NYU. I thought I wanted to do ethnographic filmmaking at the time. Um, and uh, so I, I worked my way through NYU, uh, and uh, uh, finally got to go abroad a little bit. By uh, I, I took a year off where uh, I found a fantastic job serving sushi in Malibu to the stars, where I could make a lot of money while living, you know, a lot of guys to a room, kind of. I'd save up as much money as I can uh, so that I could uh, 
uh, go off and travel, and then uh, I also then was able to use that money to go to the University of Paris and work on my French. Uh, came back, went to UCLA, uh, where on the second part of my time at UCLA, I was able to then uh, go to move to Kenya for a while, uh, work on, studied at the university, became a researcher in Kenya. I loved Kenya. Uh, also, very, very difficult time in Kenya, high conflict. Ultimately, the university was shut down for months because of conflict. Uh, there was a lot of beating up of students, these kinds of things. I had a great time. Um, I actually met my wife during that time, uh, 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 memorably. Um, and then I got this invitation. I met this guy from Madagascar who was a scholar in Madagascar, and he said, hey, why don't you come visit, whatever. And, I, and so I did. I came over to Madagascar, uh, hopped across the Mozambique Channel, uh, spent out about uh, a month there, and as much as I loved Nairobi, said, oh my god, I'm working in the wrong place. Uh, and, uh, and so I went back, I finished my master's degree, and then switched my doctorate to work in Madagascar. So off I went to Madagascar, I did work, you know, continued on my studies, went off to Madagascar for 15 months or so to do my field work, had a wonderful time, uh, all, these, all the way working on language, working on skills development. My family was still all very confused about this. The day she died, my grandmother kept saying, so what are you doing? You're becoming a doctor? Because my elbow hurts right here. You know, uh, these kinds of things. Uh, but to this day, my family still doesn't understand. I get a lot of nods from my father still. That's great. I'm yeah, very proud of you. Uh, but it doesn't follow, right? Uh, but that's okay. Um, uh, so I built my career differently than a lot of scholars, I think, that yeah, I guess I get a little antsy. Right? I still love being a professor, and I love being in the classroom, and I love my research and publishing. And, and I joke around, but it's true. If, uh, if you want to know what uh, farmers in southern Madagascar think of their water policy, I'm your guy. Uh, uh, so you know, we all get kind of narrow in our fields, but I also like to break out of that. So I take on these different hats, right? So, so I do a fair amount of consulting with uh, large agencies, uh, with, uh, with the World Bank, the USAID, or the like. Um, I've done some advising on conflict resolution teams with the UN or, or the like. Um, obviously, in, you know, like all of us on this panel play different administrative roles at the university in international education in different ways in program development. And I really enjoy that, which is why I have two hats related, related to that. Um, and I think it's really exciting in particular here and important for all of you because, to go back to something that Alfred said earlier about that, that you could have an international career in Ghana or in, or in Ecuador, but you could also have an international career in Los Angeles. Uh, if you follow uh, the A.T. Kearney uh, Index for Global Cities, Los Angeles is the sixth most global city in the world. Um, there are so many, I'm getting signs that's two now, is that the change? I've, I, wherever we're at, it is an extremely global city, uh, and it is very hard to even function in a job if you don't have that global exposure. Um, if you don't, if you don't have that global engagement, so working internationally also can mean working in Los Angeles because we are a global city. Um, so uh, to wrap it through, we were asked about any advice. Um, you know, the first is that you know your career will take a lot of different turns, and that's a good thing. And so as you take your first steps in your first job, that is not your last job, and that's okay. Um, so you you. You go with uh, your different interests as you develop your job. But that only works if you develop your skill sets first, right? So, so the three C's, the four R's, um, uh, global competencies and building on those global competencies, language capabilities, uh, you need those starting points and they're, they're absolutely requisite. Um, and with that, you got to get it right. And I'm not being glib here, that is professionalism is important in every field, no matter what. Um, you know, if you don't know something, that's generally okay. Uh, but you need to say, I don't know this, or I need to go learn it, or I need to engage someone else to help me with this. But you have to own up to that. Um, admit your ignorance, and then don't miss a deadline. Don't submit a bad report. Don't submit a badly written report. Um, don't guess, and don't get it wrong. Uh, because you'll be fired. Uh, it would be very hard to get another job. Uh, that, they, that just getting it right is actually really important. Um, learning to be diplomatic. As great as Alfred is at being diplomatic, I am not. Um, but don't follow my lead on that. Um, no one wants you to walk into a meeting and go, wow, you guys suck. Um, you know, but but you know, I, I try not to, but um, you know, I'm always the professor when I'm doing these other things outside of the university. I'm the professor 
in a group of professionals. I know you, all you've done this too, right? Uh, so, so people look at you like they expect the weirdness of being a professor, right? But we live up to it. Um, but uh, try not to take too much advantage um, in that. Um, you're thinking about your career and your life priorities. I modeled a lot of my career on my major professor for my doctorate's career. Uh, one of the warnings he gave me was he traveled internationally probably twice a month. Uh, and he was very engaged in that way, and it was a very exciting career. He still has an exciting career, he's 80-ish, um, and, uh, and still has an exciting career, but he warned me, he said, I grew up not knowing my kids, right? and I didn't want that, so I made other decisions in how I go about my career. Some, some forms of international careers, um, you are traveling all the time. You, you, you might be based in Los Angeles, but you're traveling twice a month. That has very important ramifications on, uh, on your home life. Other kinds of professions, um, Career USA professions, for instance, um, you might spend three years in any given place and then you move to the next place, um, which can be very exciting for family, but also brings about uh, its own challenges. Um, the last thing I want to make sure to say is learning how to leave it at the office. You know, we work across time zones when we're in international affairs. Uh, so, you know, my my first meeting this morning was at 7 a.m. with a, a teleconference to Ghana, right? That's normal, right? Um, that we work across. Uh, I was in Madagascar a few weeks ago, uh, and it's a terrible habit because I'll, I'll work all day in Madagascar, and then finally, 7, 8 o'clock at night, it's slowing down, which means it's 9 a.m. here, just in time to start working back home via the internet, right? Uh, you, you start to lose track. You have to learn how to leave it at the office. Uh, my, and I do this very badly. I'm a very bad role model. My wife would say that I enter into an argument about loading the dishwasher um, with an outline in mind, supporting evidence, and three references before I enter the argument. Um, and that is not a way to win a family argument. Uh, my kids will probably hate me forever because we had pop quizzes at the dinner table. So I will turn to my son and say, so what do you think of you know, Somaliland's new engagement with Somalia given this regime change, or you know, something like that. And, um, and they've grown up with this, so my 10-year-old still looks at me glassy-eyed sometimes, but she can put Lubumbashi on a map, right? So, um, uh, and, uh, um, so, so, you know, they'll probably, you know, have spite towards me the rest of my life. Uh, but, uh, uh, but so, so I don't believe that at the office well, my counsel would be do it better than I do. Uh, that uh, that, that uh, learn learn how to create that separation for family and for the rest of your uh, the rest of the other aspects of your life. Okay, can I sum any of these pieces together? Um, uh, so I think one of the themes is that we all have these different routes to where we got it, um, but we but they've been extremely passionate routes, right? That is, we've been really early on somewhere in our. Uh, education, we were bitten by something, grabbed by something, and are incredibly passionate about our careers, um, and have been from the, from the get-go. Um, uh, we were not working for water and power or something, um, uh, where, we, where we dread going into the office every day. We really are passionate and enjoy what we do, even in the thick of painful general education discussions. Uh, we, we regularly remember why we do what we do, which is very exciting, I think. Um, the other thing is I think we all focus hard on those skill sets for ourselves as well as for our students, constantly refining them, constantly working on language development, constantly working on interactions, um, how do we draw out our own skills, Life, being lifelong learners. Uh, I think that came out of everything that, that all of us have said as well, and that, that goes to that passion uh, as well. And then the final thing I think is that all of us on this panel have uh, have different aspects of what it means to be in a university setting. Uh, whatever the opposite is of ivory towerism, I think we, we all work to try to break that mold um, to look at how we engage the world in other ways. I, I just like to say that I, I found each of those five-minute presentations to be to, to contain so many jewels of, of wisdom. And thank you for your very candid and even personal perspectives on this. What a what a treasure for for the students to hear your professors talk in in this light. Okay, so I would 
I, for, I know you guys have a whole bunch of questions. I, please file up to the microphones. And, um, and, and any question, anything is fine. Uh, we're going to, to not have rules on this, um, within reason, of course. Um, and please, when you have a question, direct it to the, the person or persons who you'd like to answer. And if possible, please go ahead and stand behind the mic so we could just go one, one to the other. So whoever's got another question, please line up on that microphone or right behind this gentleman right here. So could we have your, your name and your class and uh, then your question and who you'd like it to direct it to, please. Super rich question. I, I think that's a nice, big, s slow softball for a, a few of our <laughs> panelists to take a swing at. Um, could I ask Dr. Chinchia to, to start with that? Uh, that's kind of tough um, because a lot of the things I do have had to do with women's rights. And um, so we do, I do believe there are certain basic international human rights that should apply everywhere, but maybe apply in different ways, let's say. But in terms of um, rights we think of as feminists that, that are under the rubric of feminism, in my case, I, I've had to wait until people are ready themselves. So in Guatemala, after the war, after the peace accords, some women contacted me and said, we want to start a feminist organization in Guatemala. We want to argue for reproductive rights, and we want to argue for uh, women's uh, control over their bodies and domestic violence legislation and so forth. So I mean, they were really putting themselves on the front line and, and uh, in a very courageous position. And I said, whatever you want, I will support you. I will share what I know from here, from being in women's studies and being an active, uh, active feminist. Um, but basically, you, you tell me what your priority is, and then I'll share what I know. So that's the way I've faced it. Um, I haven't worked in the Middle East or other places where thing, there might be really different perspectives. But I know that in Indian villages in Guatemala, for example, um, there was a whole campaign to educate around human rights. And, and in the workshops I go to in the, in, the, in the villages, the women would come and we would read, they would read and translate into languages the Declaration of Human Rights. So they knew exactly what was in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. They might interpret it in their own way but they didn't really challenge that idea that there was universal human rights. And then they would use that to confront the government and say, we know that we have a right to yeah, whatever uh, housing, whatever, because it's in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. <laughs> I guess homosexuality was the big problem, was the big conflict, you know, there whether you were going to talk openly about it. But again, you know, I mean, yeah, I think as an, as an outsider, you have to wait till people inside want to take it up. And then you have a choice, right? You can either support them or stay out of it. Uh, one thing that I did notice is that uh, women wanted to talk to me about things that they didn't have access to, like birth control. So they figured, because I was an American, because I was a feminist, you know. <laughs> It was okay to talk to me about it when it wasn't okay to talk to their their comrades or their fellow people at the organizations that they were I'll just reinforce a couple of the points as a very different geographic experience. Uh, first, first is I agree entirely that there are some parts that are universal human rights, some parts that we have to be more adaptive about. Um, definitionally, I think it often becomes a problem. Um, so I'll give the example of human trafficking in Madagascar. Um, that there is what I would define as a real problem to confront in human rights related to human trafficking. But that's one of three different things going on that, that we as the US government uh, uh, define together. And by lumping them together, I think we actually exacerbate a problem. Uh, that is, I think we make the problem that is the real problem of human trafficking in the, that big word sets, um, we, we sort of minimize it by lumping it together with things that are culturally normed. 
Um, so, or, or defined differently. So if you are effectively in indentured servitude in the mining sector, that is not the same thing requiring the same responses as human trafficking, especially transboundary trafficking. Um, different again from there's in very poor families, there's a long established, centuries established um, process with a whole language around it, built around it in Malgash, um, about uh, you basically give your children to a wealthy family to be servants in the family, but there's all these norms around it. They have to be given education, they have to be given um, a certain quality of life, uh, they can't be beaten, there's like all these rules about it. And when they turn 18, after they've gotten an education through secondary school, then they're done. And so from that very, very impoverished family standpoint, they feel like they're doing something for their children um, as opposed to doing something to their children. Um, so we can differ we can debate whether that's okay or not, but it but not defining things differently, I think sometimes makes for problems and we have more effort to do. One other example, and that is I, I spent some time at Ben Gurion University in the Negev and, and worked with Bedouin communities for a while. And uh, working in Bedouin communities I found very difficult. Uh, because first of all, I don't speak Arabic. That's a very big thing, and I definitely don't speak Bedouin Arabic. Uh, and worse, I do speak Hebrew, um, and uh, and that's actually better to speak English in in such communities um, for political reasons. Um, uh, but uh, working working in such communities on a daily basis, there were issues that I found very abhorrent and in particular for roles of women. Um, but I did not feel in my place to rock that at all. I was working on water issues. I'm trying to understand water issues. I'm trying to look at policy on water issues. I did I felt like I had to I had to be the one culturally adapting, not trying to uh, create some normative change in the community in which I was working. From a from a different context and, and, a, and a different point I'll make so so it, the early 2000s, 2002, 2006, I, I, I led um, what was the, the largest U.S. NGO in St. Petersburg, Russia at the time. Russia had a, a, a young new president who took, uh, took office in 2000, and he's still there. Um, and and, and through, my, through my time there, we, we could feel kind of increasingly um, the political screws tightening in different ways in St. Petersburg. Uh, but in my role as, as the director, we had about 15 staff members in the NGO at the time working closely. You know, most of the programs we did were U.S. government sponsored, State Department and, and USAID, educational related um, academic exchanges, that sort of thing. Uh, and, you know, we, you know, we lived our life the way we liked. We, we had you know, a lot of friends who were very active in the LGBT community in St. Petersburg, which was experiencing increasingly level, increasing levels of, of repression at the time. Uh, but in my role, and, and this, this is, you know, and I'm sure Alfred can speak to this too, that you know, I was perceived as essentially working for the U.S. government, although in my mind I was independent of an NGO, but that didn't matter. And so you know, for, for me to uh, public, publicly take a stand against certain issues or things that I saw happening around me um, and would have endangered you know, the work that I believed in, the, the sort of the educational work that was, that was building kind of for the long term. And so, so when you're in these roles uh, overseas, internationally, uh, especially if it's, if it's a, a government role, uh, then then you have to you have to be diplomatic, yes, and, and, and you have to be uh, tactical about you know, you know, choosing when to say what you really think. Uh, and often that, that can be that can be a difficult thing to do uh, when you believe in things passionately. You, you have to make make choices about what is this is something positive going to come of this, or is this something that could actually lead to something. And that's advice that I give to uh, sending you know, U.S. students would come to uh, to Russia at the time, and there would be protests you know, of, uh, of various kinds, and, and uh, you know, leading up, up to 2013 when there were protests in Russia, you know, the students were drawn to that. They wanted to take part in that. But the the worst thing that they could do if they if they believed the the people who were protesting against the regime, the worst thing they could do was show up there because they would be used. They would be picked out of that crowd and used and, and as evidence that it was the Americans who were fomenting this unrest. So you can become an, an unwitting tool that actually works against what you're passionate about. Uh, if, if you're not savvy about how you're going to be perceived in these different, these different contexts. Any, any further comments? Okay, thank you for that question. 
It was a big question. You got three super interesting angles, perspectives to answer it. Before we go over to you, if, um, if there's another question, if you wouldn't mind sitting up near there. I, we're going over here first, but I just wanted to go rapid fire. Ma'am, thank you for showing up. Uh, your name and your question, please. I think you're not sure exactly. I mean, we've all had the experience of coming back and finding it difficult to reintegrate, reintegrate into the culture, right? The politics and whatever else. Um, sometimes you go through a lot of depression, frankly, and you just, nobody understands you. Um, is it just kind of accepting that maybe socially you'll be in a little bit of a different place? Because I well, you're changed. Yeah. You're not the person who went abroad. You're a different person. So. Yeah, no, you'll, you'll, find other, you'll find other people who have had different experiences and you'll eventually gravitate towards them or a place to work with or things like that. I know one thing I learned when I came back, you know, the choice that we have here in the U.S. is overwhelming. Like, so you walk down the cereal aisle and you really can't pick. So to this day, when I go out to dinner, the first thing on the menu that looks good, I stop right there and order it. And <laughs> so just so there are simplify. Ways to reduce the anxiety. I just felt that that's a, a common issue that a lot of people face. Yeah. So. I think one of the hardest things is that people are individualized and in, Cal in Southern California, they're very spread out. And so there's a loneliness, really. You know, if you think you have friends, but they're in that nice, they're in Pomona, they're, or they're, maybe they're here, but they're just so busy. Whereas when, when I go abroad, even when I go, when I go to Guatemala, people work very hard, but they always have time for, for leisure, you know, for socializing. They always have time, no matter what, no matter what, it's poor, they're rich. And you come back and it's like, can I get together with you? Yeah, they take out their agenda. And like they have an hour, you know, a month from now. It's like, no, I need a friend. Or they, then they say, well, I'm a therapist. No, no, it's not a therapist. I need it. It's just human activity I need. And I've had it, and now I don't have it. And I don't know how to get it. But, um, but you know, you can't, you work on it, right? You try to name it. And you at least we have coffee shops now where you can hang out with other people. They didn't even used to have coffee shops. Yeah, I, yeah the study abroad world we call that sort of a reverse culture shock, right? So, so it, it, it's something that you, you never you never stop experiencing. And so I mean, I've been in many parts of the world and go go back. I'm, I'm married to a Russian. Go back and forth all the time, but every time I go back and forth, when I come back to the states or go to Russia, there's always that that transition period, and and, and you, you you learn to recognize that in yourself, um, in, in that you're you're adapting, and, and there's a level of discomfort that you feel uh, that you feel like you're not connecting with people as deeply as you might because because they're coming at it with, with a different set of assumptions, a different perspective, uh, but then you, you you recognize that that's normal, and you find ways to relate to people. Um, that, that that's a part of that, that adaptation. I think. You know, one thing I, you know, in international careers, you you you're gonna you're gonna make a lot of friends all over the world um, as you go off on that adventure. But you're probably gonna lose some friends too, and so you gotta be ready. For that. There's one thing to add, and that is, I think, and I agree with everything, but I also think it gets easier in a way. Um, that is. It's, it's kind of like with language. As you're more and more bilingual, you can move back and forth between the language better. It's true interculturally as well, right? So um, that you can, you know, when I'm going back and forth to Madagascar, right? uh, uh, you know, it's been 25 years, it's a long time, and, uh, and I feel like the registry of my voice changes, the way my mannerisms change, like, I, like you adapt and very quickly and you don't even realize it because it's part of who you are. I think about sometimes that until recently I, I kept the equivalent of a corporate apartment in a third evil. And so I have the same apartment, same phone number, group of friends. I'm there twice a year. I drop in and out. None of my family here knows that. I don't have another wife, by the way. But, <laughs> <laughs> but, but, I, have, but, I, but my family are nothing about that and doesn't 
they would never recognize me in that setting, even, right? Um, but, but it just becomes natural, just like we would be doing languages. Um, and I think it also, with, a, with new places, it becomes that much more easily. So I've been, um, I don't know, um, uh, a student of Dr. Shinji, I think, of, uh, of Guatemala, as I've been the last couple of years through Guatemala, and we're trying to learn a little bit about Guatemala. But, you know, I don't actually have that much pain in coming back because I move around a lot, I get very used to that intercultural adaptation. That was not true 10 years ago. And 10 years ago, actually, I'll go with what Paul was saying, that uh, the single biggest thing I used to always have our time with was Costco. Um, <laughs> you know, coming back to Costco, I could not deal with that. Right? Uh, uh, these wheels of cheese or something, right? Um, but, but now, like, I feel like I adapt much more quickly, I guess. Uh, so I do think it gets easier and easier. I just said one last thing too, and, it, and, it, and it, it sounds like you know you're you're really struggling, but don't forget, you know, um, some of those qualities of life or some of those things that you experienced um, are worth sharing. And um, you know, we, we talk about how we don't have enough time here and so on and so forth. You know, if, if you go and have tea with friends in Mali, it's a two and a half hour affair. You have three rounds of tea, you really have lunch, and you relax, you talk, and you sleep a little bit, you talk some more, you work, you know, and, you know, and but. Do, you know, I, I, when I do that for friends here, when I say, hey, we're gonna have tea, and it's Molly and tea, and you gotta sit around for three rounds, and we're gonna talk for a couple hours, they actually really appreciate that. So bring some of those things back and, and introduce them to some friends, and you'd be surprised. People might actually really appreciate that. Great, thank you. Great question, and, and super interesting answers as well. And the last question, the floor is yours, thank you. Primarily what I encountered in, in, in Russia was, was anti-Americanism that, that, that could at times be intense on, on, on the verge of, of violence. Um, and you, you, you develop, I guess I developed, I'll tell you a story. So, so there was one time I came back from, from work in, in Moscow, my apartment, and, and I was, I was followed from the metro to my apartment, and it happened to be payday, and this is 1997 Russian. Payday meant, meant you had a big lump of cash, a big lump of cash in my pocket. Now, nobody knew that, but, but me. But I was, I was accompanied from the, uh, the metro by a couple of uh, very young, barely 18 police officers. And you know, in Russia, you probably, you, if you see police officers, you, you, you won't want to run the other way because it's not, that's not a good situation. And, and they, they clearly were looking for a target to, to kind of extort a, a bribe, and, and you know, I, I, was, I was able, and so I, and they took me behind some buildings, and I thought, this is not good, this is, this is really bad timing, it's my payday. Um, it was interesting, they, they, they latched on to that I was an American, but because I was able to, to speak fluent Russian, I could actually joke with them about various things, I was able to kind of defuse the situation. So, so linguistically, that, that, that ability and the ability to kind of you know, have a sense of humor about yourself, I think I probably you know, said some, some self-deprecating things, and joking you know, something about America, that, that, that helped them, that kind of you know, put them at, at ease and, and, didn't, and, and kind of humanized me, I guess, in their eyes. Uh, so it wasn't just this American target for them. as expected in other areas, then the, the, unex the area in which you can't change race, gender, sexual orientation, or whether at least has a chance of getting accepted um, because it's not tied up with all these other things, you know, like just being culturally inappropriate or, or, or um, but it, it's tough because at different moments in, in attitudes change over time 
And, and when I first went to Guatemala, I mean, even being a woman at the university, I, I asked to go to the law school when all the other Fulbrights always went to the School of Humanities. And of course, I was oblivious to what I was at. But it was the closest thing. There was no sociology or political science. So I went into the law school, like, and the cultural attaché said, you're on your own. You'll get raped. There's communists there. There's everything. And I'm like, no, no, no. I, but you know, it was a hostile environment. They did not want me because, not because, uh, because it was an American, because the coup had happened in '54 and the CIA had helped, and, and because they were involved in retrospect in different underground leftist movements, and and people didn't like me, and you know they were hostile, really hostile. Um, but later on, I think the issues of gender and of sexual orientation have been the most challenging. Um, so you're around male academics in Guatemala or high, you know, male leftists who are, you know, idolized and not critiqued, and it's pretty, it's pretty awful sometimes because you, as an outsider, you can't really take all that on. But what you try, what I try to do, and it seems to be the only thing I can make work, is just to be, to make really good friendships, and then, you know, as, when you get a group of friends, they will protect, they will, they will be part of your protection, right, and your advocate. And if you're accepted by that group, then it's easier to get accepted by other people. But sometimes you just can't be in your face. You can't do what you do here. You have to go at it strategically, and. Um, now in Guatemala, I mean, they're gay and lesbian groups, so there's a whole group of people who do are accepting, but there are others who aren't. So you just have to be very kind of careful. Uh, one more thing, and that is, uh, you know, whenever you're abroad, you you enter into a particularized identity landscape, right? And you bring with you whatever those aspects are. So in part, you might sometimes it might be that you're an American. Other times, it might be that you're white or Hispanic or whatever you are uh, in terms of race. Uh, it might be because of your gender or your sexual orientation, but you, even though you're coming from the outside, often that interplays with, uh, sorry to be Bordellian for a minute, but, but the intertwined historicity of the country in which you are uh, embedding yourself. Right? Um, so, so uh, I'm seeing a grimace here. <laughs> but, but you are, right? And so how do you play out that role uh, can be very challenging. So in my case, usually, I'm not always perceived as white, actually, but like most places. Um, and white, male, American, big, six foot one, big guy, right? Uh, it, it's a very specific kind of thing. So the big manism role comes up often, and I hate that role. I'm very uncomfortable with that role. Um, and so trying to change my role is very different. So I'm, I'm loved and adored by the very people that Dr. Chia was just saying uh, are very difficult for her to deal with, right? But I don't want to be in that role, so how do I change the nature of that relationship? I've been in some very complex situations, and to go with one of the things Terrence was saying, so for instance, uh, in Uganda, I ran into a problem because the military ran me down with their truck. And they were then concerned because I'm of a certain stature as far as they're concerned, and they didn't know what to do about the fact that they can get in a lot of trouble or running me down and not someone else down. So their determination of the best way to handle it, it was literally a dark and stormy night in the middle of a and, uh, and their way of dealing with it was they decided to cut me into small pieces and shred me through the forest would be the best way to handle it. And I didn't think that was the best way to handle it. Um, and, and it really is. If I didn't speak Swahili, I, 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 I was able to negotiate the outcome. It was a second language for both of us in Uganda. It's not a Swahili-speaking country, but it's a region where there's enough, and we can negotiate the outcome. And ultimately, we negotiated out that they would take my motorcycle and my glasses and take off and leave me in the forest in the rain. <laughs> and, uh, 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 but otherwise, they would not leave me in pieces in the forest, right? Um, so, but but the problem came up um, if I, if I was not some white American dude. Um, then they would not be worried about how their boss would perceive that they ran me down, right? So I had to negotiate that outcome um, using acquired language skills and all kind of stuff, right? Uh, but it's very challenging. So how do you, even when you're in the advantage position, which I normally am, um, how do you negotiate out the position when you don't want that role, you want to be in a different role, or that role gets you to some other kind of
Yeah. No, I would just echo what Richard said. I have very similar experience. And um, I, don't know, I would echo the others too in that, in that you know, in, in Molly in particular, you know, you can diffuse anything with a good joke. Um, really. And, and that's first and foremost what people look for in something. Can they, can they laugh about themselves? Can they, can they, can they you got another language. Thank you for that great question. I'm going to ask uh, Jessica's here and Manuel. Uh, we got you guys for only 10 more minutes. Please hold on for 10 more minutes. And before I spend, send the microphone over to Jessica, huge round of applause for great questions and super answers. Thank you. <laughs> Jessica, over to you. Hi, you guys. I, yeah, I just wanted to um, thank our keynote speaker, Alfred, and all of our panelists for helping, uh, you know, organize this event, partake in this event, share their experiences. Um, these are incredible resources, as Alfred said, that you have on campus here every day. And, um, you know, don't just go to class and, and go home and think about this later. Like, go bug them, send them emails, say meet with me, and, you know, devise a plan because they're here for you and they want to hear what you guys are up to and, and you know they want to help you achieve your goals too. Um, so with that being said, um, I just wanted to share, you know, this event is the first event um, because this is Peace Corps Week. Um, I know some of you, is, is Lauren still here? Did she go? There she is. So Lauren um, is has been accepted to Peace Corps. So she... Yeah, she's going to be going to Senegal. So um, yeah, if you want to pick her brain um, about the application process, I also just wanted to share her achievement. Um, but I just wanted to, to talk a little bit, um, I wanted to share a quote. Um, so to a crowd of students at the University of Michigan on October 14, 1960, a Democratic presidential nominee John F. Kennedy asked a large crowd of students, this is when he was um, going against uh, Nixon, and he said, how many of you who are going to be doctors are willing to spend your days in Ghana? Technicians or engineers, how many of you are willing to work in a foreign service and spend your lives traveling around the world? On your willingness to do that, not merely to serve one or two years in the service, but on your willingness to contribute part of your life to this country, I think will depend the answer whether a free society can compete. I think it can, and I think Americans are willing to contribute, but the effort must be far greater than we've ever made in the past. Unless you've, you comprehend the nature of what is being asked of you, this country can't possibly move through the next 10 years in a period of relative strength. So given the 1960s was a different period, I think we are now in a different period as well. And we can't just leave the ball in our leaders' court. We have to take peace and development and you know the action of our whole world into our own hands, right? And so, um, so yeah, I just wanted to leave that. You know, that kind of was the starting, the founding of Peace Corps um, about 57 years ago. And um, you know, I'm here to promote Peace Corps, but I'm also here to promote your guys' international experiences as well. And um, I just want to thank you for coming today from Peace Corps, from the Center of International Education, from the International Studies Program, um, from the Career Development Center, from USA. Thank you for joining us tonight. And um, if you happen to have some more free time tomorrow, we're gonna have um, a bunch of return Peace Corps volunteers from Burkina Faso, from Chad, from Guinea. Um, if Lars can, can come from Mali, I, I served in China. Um, we're going to bring some food from our, our host countries and we're going to tell you about what it's like to, you know, to live for two years with little resources and, you know, squat toilets and whatnot. And, um, you know, that's tomorrow in the Anatole Center from 5.30 to 7.30. So, you know, bring your friends or just have some food. It's going to be a fun time. And uh, on Thursday, we're going to have an info session. So if you, you know, want to pick Lauren's brain and hear how she got in, um, or if you just want to, you know, um, ask me some of the details, that's going to be in the Career Development Center from 1.30 to 3.30 on Thursday. So um, we're here, we're celebrating Peace Corps Week, but uh, we're here for you guys. So thank you again so much for being here, and have a good evening.